Order, before we come to Prime Minister's questions, I would like to point out that the British Sign Language Interpretation Proceedings is available to watch on the Parliament Live TV. We now come to Prime Minister's questions. Prime Minister! Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mick Whitley! Number one. Mr. Uh, colleagues and others, in addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Mick Whitley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In the run-up to the last election, the Prime Minister said that it's clearly and it's wrong that hundreds of thousands of people are forced to rely on food banks to survive. But research released by the Trussell Trust today showed that one in six people fear that they will almost certainly have to use a food bank in just four weeks' time as a result of the government's decision to add the £20 uplift to Universal Crescent. That's over 500 families and 1,000 children being forced into food poverty in my constituency of Birkenhead alone. Will the Prime Minister concede that the cut to universal credit is wrong, and will he change course? Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Speaker, in fact, uh, of course, I'm very grateful to everybody who helps with, uh, with food banks, and they do a fantastic job. Uh, but what this government has done throughout the, the pandemic is to put the most protection uh, for those who need it most across society. And I'm proud of what we've done uh, by uplifting uh, the living wage, and proud of the arm we put around the whole of the British people. Greg yeah. McKinley. Yeah, Thank you, Mr. Yeah, Speaker. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, could my right honourable friend offer me an answer to the constituents I have of the future as they sit around a tepid radiator powered by a, an inefficient and expensive air, hall, uh, air source heating unit, uh, worrying about the payments on the electric car that they didn't want either, while they watch the growing economies of the world going hell for leather building new gas and coal power stations? Because they will be asking me why. Could the Prime Minister please commit to solutions that are technologically possible to reduce Britain's CO2 rather than uncosted commitments, which I'm sorry we will be hearing a lot of at COP26? Uh, well, Mr. Speaker, not, not only has the, the price of batteries fallen uh, vertiginously, uh, the cost of solar power has fallen vertiginously, but I uh, tell my, my honourable friend uh, uh, the people of, of Sanit, Sanit South where they have, they have huge opportunities. The, the cost of, of wind power in this country uh, has fallen 70 per cent just in the last 10 years. And what I think the people of Sanit want to see, and I'm sure he exemplifies it, is a spirit of Promethean technological optimism, Mr. Speaker. Come for the Leader of the Opposition, right or wrong, Keir Starmer. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I want to ask the Prime Minister about the promise he made to the British people to guarantee that no one needing care has to sell their home to pay for it. Does that guarantee still stand? Yes or no? yes. Mr Speaker, what this plan for health and social care does is deal after decades with the catastrophic costs faced by millions of people, the risks that they face up and down the the country that they could face the loss of their home, their possessions, their ability to pass on anything uh, to their children. This is the government that is not only dealing with that problem, but understands that in order to, to deal with the problems of the NHS backlogs, you also have to fix social care. We're taking the tough decisions, Mr Speaker, that the country wants to see. We're putting another £36 billion in. And what I'd like to know from the leader of the Labour Party, uh, Mr Speaker, is what is he going to do tonight? The silence, silence from mission control in his... Can I just say, if you don't want to hear the Prime Minister, I certainly do, and I can't hear him. It's not acceptable. Prime Minister, have you finished? Leader of the Opposition, whether he's going to vote for our measures tonight, Mr Speaker. I, I, know, I know the House has been away, but it's still Prime Minister's questions. Keir Salmer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I noticed the Prime Minister didn't stand by his guarantee that no one will need to sell their house to pay for care. Let me explain, let me explain why he didn't. Under the Prime Minister's plan, someone with £186,000, if you include the value of their home, that's not untypical across the country in all of your constituents, facing large costs because they have to go into care, will have to pay £86,000 under his plan, and that's before living costs. Where does the Prime Minister think that they're going to get that £86,000 without selling their home? 
uh, Mr Speaker, as, as I think everybody understood in the long uh, debate, the long uh, statement yesterday, uh, this is the first time that the state has actually come in to deal with the threat of these catastrophic costs, uh, and thereby, thereby enabling, Mr Speaker, the private sector, the financial services industry, to supply the, uh, the products, the insurance products that people need to guarantee themselves against the cost uh, of care. And what we're actually doing, Mr Speaker, is lifting the floor, lifting the, the guarantee for uh, by to, up to £100,000, where you, nobody has to pay anything across the, across the entire country. And what we still have to hear from the, from the opposition is what they would do to fix the backlogs, fix the backlogs in the NHS. Uh, and fix social care after decades of inertia and inactivity. What would he do? Keir Starmer. His plan, his plan is to impose, his plan is to impose an unfair tax on working people. My plan is to ensure, my plan is to ensure that those with the broadest shoulders pay their fair share. That is the difference. That is the oh, 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 oh. Both sides. I need to hear the question. I also need to hear the answers. If there's some MPs who don't want to hear it, and I'm sure the constituents want to hear it, it's not good to shout either side down when they are either asking or answering a question. Please, our constituents are interested. I want to hear, and they'll want to hear. Kiss down. Thank you, Mr Speaker. His plan is to impose unfair taxes on working people. My plan is to ensure those with the broadest shoulders pay their fair share. Yeah. I know they don't like that device. Yeah. The truth is, his plans don't do what he claims. People will still face huge bills. Many homeowners will need to sell their homes. He's not denying it when he could have done. And the Prime Minister has failed the only test he set for himself for social care. It was in the manifesto. Another manifesto promised, Prime Minister. No good shaking your head. And who's going to pay for the cost of this failure? Working people. Yeah. Under, his plan, under his plan, a landlord renting out dozens of properties won't pay a penny more, yeah. Yeah. but their tenants in work will face tax rises of hundreds of pounds a year. A care worker earning the minimum wage doesn't get a pay rise under this plan but does get a tax rise. In what world, in what world is that fair? Uh, Mr Speaker, actually the Institute for Fiscal Studies uh, has confirmed that this is a broad-based and progressive measure. Uh, the, the, top, the top 20 per cent of, of households uh, by income will pay 40 times uh, what the poorest uh, 20 per cent pay. The top 14 per cent pay uh, half of the, the entire levy. Now, Mr Speaker, he talks about his plan. Well, actually, it turns out I have been scouring the records uh, for evidence of the Labour plan, and I found it, Mr Speaker, in 2018, the current Shadow Secretary of State uh, for Social Care joined forces with Nick Bowles and Norman Lamb to promote a new dedicated health and social care tax, Mr. Speaker, based on national insurance. <laughs> the current, where is she? I can't see her. I can't see her in her place, Mr. Speaker. And she said, she said this was to be, this was to be the country's beverage moment. <laughs> Well, what, is the Labour Party really going to vote against the new beverage moment tonight? Mr Speaker, mi Mr. Speaker, let me tell you what an ambitious young member for Henley said in 2002 <laughs> in this House. What he said in this House. National insurance increases are regressive. I wonder what happened to him. Mr Speaker, if the Prime Minister is going ahead with this unfair tax, can he at least tell us this? Will his plan clear the NHS waiting list backlog by the end of this Parliament? Yes or no? Mr Speaker, I think the whole House and the whole country can appreciate that we at least have a plan. Yeah. Uh, 
to fix the backlogs. And we at least understand, Mr Speaker, that the only way to fix the long-term underlying problems in the NHS, uh, the problem of delayed discharges, is to fix the crisis in social care as well, which Labour failed to address for decades. Uh, and we're going on uh, and ahead and doing it, Mr Speaker. And what, what I've just understood for him tonight, I think, I think out of that, out of that minestrone of nonsense has floated a crouton of fact. He is going to vote against the measures tonight. They're going to vote against plans to fix the backlogs and fix social care. Vote Labour, Mr Speaker. Wait longer. Yes. Mr Speaker, it was a yes-no question. You either clear the backlog or you don't. And he can say, he can't even say that he'll do that. So there we have it. Working people will pay higher tax. Those in need will still lose their homes to pay for care. And he can't even say if the NHS backlog will be cleared. Well, he gesticulates, but they're all breaking their manifesto promises and putting up taxes on their working constituents for this. And, Mr Speaker, tax rises aren't the only way he's making working people worse off. 2.5 million, million working families will face a double whammy, a national insurance tax rise and a thousand pounds a year universal credit cut. They're getting hit from both sides of all the ways to raise public funds. Why is the Prime Minister insisting on hammering working people? Mr Speaker, we're proud of what we've been doing throughout this pandemic to look after working people. We're proud of the, of the extra £9 billion pounds that we put in through universal credit. And Mr Speaker, I think pe- people in this House and across the country should know Labour wants to scrap universal credit altogether. We believe, we believe in higher wages and better skills, Mr Speaker, and, and it is working. That's why we've, we've invested in 13,500 work coaches, £3,000 a year for 11 million adults across this country to train under the Lifetime Skills Guarantee. And it's working, Mr Speaker, because for the first time since 2019, after, after years and years of stagnation, you are seeing wages, wages are rising, Mr Speaker. Wages are rising. Wages, wages are rising for the lower paid. They believe in welfare. We believe in higher wages and higher skills and better jobs. High wages and higher skills, he says. How out of touch he is. What, what do they, they laugh? What do they say to Rosie? What do they say to Rosie? Because Rosie's the sort of person that this impacts on. Laugh away. A single mother working on the minimum wage in a nursing home. She got in touch with me. She will lose £87 a month due to the universal credit cut. A huge amount to her. She will now also be hit with a national insurance tax rise. She's asked for more shifts and she can't get them. She's unable to get further help with childcare. What does the Prime Minister, what does the laughter say to Rosie? This is a government that underfunded the NHS for a decade before the pandemic, took £8 million out of social care before the pandemic, then wasted billions of pounds of taxpayers' money on dodgy contracts, vanity projects and giveaways to their mates. They cut stamp duty on second homeowners, super tax deductions for the biggest companies, and now, now they're telling millions of working people that they must cough up more tax. Isn't this the same old Tory party always putting their rich mates and donors before working people? Minister. Well, I think very sadly, Mr Speaker, what you're hearing is the same old nonsense from Labour because uh, what they want to do, they want to scrap a universal credit and I have every I have every sympathy for, for Rosie and I admire uh, her and, and families up and down up and down the land. But the best thing we can do for them is have a strong and dynamic economy. And as I t- as I speak to you now, 
our economy is the fastest growing in the G7, uh, Mr. Speaker, because we've had the fastest vaccine rollout and the fastest opening up of any comparable country, Mr. Speaker. And never forget that he would have kept us in the European Medicines Agency. He attacked. He did. He attacked the vaccines task force, Mr. Speaker. And if we'd listened to, if we'd listened to Captain Hindsight in July, Mr. Speaker, we wouldn't have the fastest growing economy in the G7. We'd still be in lockdown, Mr. Speaker. And it, it's true. And if we listened to him today, we wouldn't be trying to fix the NHS backlogs, and we wouldn't be finally dealing with social care, Mr. Speaker. This is the country. This is the government that takes the tough decisions to take this country forward. A little more if you listen to Mr Jones's question, David Jones. <laughs> Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, will, does my right honourable friend agree that uh, while the recent extension of the grace periods for the movement of goods between Great Britain and Northern Ireland is welcome, it does not yet amount to a permanent fix of the Northern Ireland Protocol, which Lord Trimble suggests is inimical to the Belfast Agreement? And will he confirm that in the continuing negotiations, the Government will draw the attention of the EU to the positive advantages of mutual enforcement as advocated in the recent excellent paper by the Centre for Brexit Policy. Yes, uh, I I thank both my right honourable friend and the the Centre for Brexit Policy uh, for for their analysis. And uh, it's it's good that the interim period has been extended because clearly the the protocol, as it is being applied by our friends in the EU, is not, in my view, protecting the Belfast Good Friday Agreement as it should in all its aspects. And we must sort it out. Leader of the SNP, Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Yesterday, without consultation, the Prime Minister announced plans to impose a regressive Tory poll tax on millions of Scottish workers. The Joseph Rowntree Foundation estimates that around two million families on low incomes will now pay an average of an extra £100 a year because of the Prime Minister's tax hike. Yet again, the Tories are fleecing Scottish families, hitting low and middle income workers and penalising the young. A Tory Work and Pension Secretary, former Tory Work and Pension Secretary, called it a sham. A former Tory Chancellor has said this is the poor subsidising the rich. A former Tory Prime Minister has called this regressive. Prime Minister, isn't this the case that this Tory tax hike is once again balancing the books on the backs of the poor and the young? Mr Speaker, the the right honourable gentleman says there was no consultation. Actually, I much enjoy uh, my conversations with representatives of the the Scottish Administration. And one thing they said to me uh, was they wanted more funding uh, for the NHS, uh, Mr Speaker. And uh, I'm delighted that we're putting another £1.1 billion uh, into the NHS and uh, in Scotland, Mr Speaker, while all they can talk about is another referendum. And I think that that that, that is uh, a clear distinction uh, between uh, us and uh, the Scottish Nationalist parties about what are the real priorities of the people of this country. In Blackfoot. No answer to the question, because the facts are this is a tax hike on the poor and on the young, Prime Minister, and you should be ashamed of yourself, Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, we now know the economic direction of this toxic Tory government. We're going to see furlough scrap, universal credit cut, more tax hikes for the low paid. Let us be in no doubt, this is the return of the Tories' austerity agenda. It is austerity 2.0. On this Prime Minister's watch, the United Kingdom now has the worst levels of poverty and inequality anywhere in North West Europe. And in-work poverty, Prime Minister, has risen to record levels this century. More Tory austerity cuts will make this even worse. Scotland deserves better. There is clearly no chance of a fair Covid recovery under this Prime Minister and under this Westminster Government. Isn't it the case, Mr Speaker, that the only way to protect Scotland from Tory cuts and the regressive tax hikes is to become an independent country with the full powers needed to build a fair, strong and equal recovery for the people of Scotland? 
well, Mr. Speaker, I don't think that is the right priority for this country or for the, for the people of, of Scotland. And I just remind him, actually, the words of the deputy leader of the, of the Scottish government, who uh, welcomed it when, when uh, the Labour government put up uh, NI by a penny to pay for uh, na- national health. Service. He said, I'm absolutely delighted. There's a guy called John Swinney. I'm absolutely delighted that the Chancellor of the Exchequer has now accepted that progressive, progressive, progressive taxation is required to invest in the health service in Scotland, Mr. Speaker. I mean, get your story straight. Uh, this, is, this is more cash for people in Scotland, it's more investment for families in Scotland, it's good for Scotland and good for the whole of the United Kingdom. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The growing populations of Grantham and Stanford require a long-term integrated healthcare strategy. Can the Prime Minister confirm what action the government is taking to implement regular reviews of healthcare provision to meet the future needs of my constituency? Yeah. Uh, uh, I hear my honourable friend is, is quite right. He's a great advocate for people in Grantham and, uh, and Stanford, and the, uh, the health and care bill uh, will uh, ensure that there are integrated healthcare partnerships uh, bringing together uh, local authorities and uh, local health care, but there is uh, more to be done, and, will, and that will be done in the forthcoming White Paper. Ed David. Mr Speaker, yesterday's social care plan forgot family carers. Yet we're the millions wiping bottoms, washing and dressing our loved ones, whether they're elderly or disabled, ill or dying. We carers just want a fair deal. So will the Prime Minister raise carers' allowance? Will he guarantee proper breaks for carers? Will he change employment law so we can balance caring with work? And will he ensure there are enough professional carers to help, starting with a new visa for carers? Mr Speaker, we carers have a lifetime of ideas to improve our loved ones' care. So why does the Prime Minister keep ignoring us and taking carers for granted. Yeah. Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, I think the whole—I think the whole—I certainly, and I think the whole House acknowledges the, the massive uh, debt we owe to unpaid carers, uh, yeah. such as himself, up and down the up and down the, can, uh, the country. And we thank them for what they're doing. What this uh, what this plan does is, of course, mean that there will be a huge injection of support, uh, both from the private sector and from the government, into uh, caring across. The board, and I believe that will support unpaid carers as well, uh, since they will no longer have the anxiety, for instance, that their, their, their loved ones, their elderly loved ones, uh, could see uh, the loss of all their possessions. What we're also doing for carers is making sure that we invest now uh, half a billion pounds in their training, in their profession, to make sure that they have the dignity and uh, progression in their jobs that they deserve. Yeah. Rob Roberts. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Aeneon and Ethel Jones from Munith Mostyn Dairy in my constituency have created a real buzz. They've created a real buzz by serving a self-serve milk facility on their farm for the local community. Sadly, the local council have served them with an enforcement notice, which has led to almost 9,000 locals signing a petition in support of them. Does my right honourable friend agree that businesses that have done their best to survive and diversify over this horrendous last year? should be supported and not threatened by the local authority as they do all they can to grow their business. I I thank him for his question. As he knows, planning is a a, a devolved matter. But what I can tell him in the House is that we provided business with over £100 billion of support throughout the pandemic, including uh, £1.5 million bounce-back loans to SMEs such as the one he describes. Ben Lake. Mr Speaker, with widespread concern about the HGV driver crisis, I have been contacted by a number of drivers from Ceredigion who believe the decision to increase drivers' hours will fail to solve the problem. They are clear that a long-term solution requires improved working conditions, acting on the 2018 Government report on parking spaces and driver facilities, and also measures to reduce waiting times at distribution centres. Will the Prime Minister consider these measures? And to what time scale is his government working to fix the crisis? I I thank the honourable gentleman. I also thank him for uh, for notice of his uh, his question. We're working with industry to uh, get more people into HGV uh, driving, which is a a great and and well remunerated uh, profession, uh, including by ramping up vocational uh, test capacity, funding apprenticeships uh, for people training as a lorry driver. As the House heard earlier on, 
uh, this is an issue. Uh, the career structure of, uh, of HGV drivers is affecting countries across the whole of the, of the EU. But can I propose that uh, the, the honourable gentleman takes up his proposal directly uh, with my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Transport? Richard Drax, close question. Yeah. Number 15, sir. Mr Speaker, this Government is committed to levelling up the whole country, and Dorset is no exception. I am delighted that the Local Growth Fund in Dorset has contributed £98.4 million to 54 projects since 2015, and I understand that Dorset Council have also made a bid to the levelling up fund to improve access at Weymouth Station. Richard Drax. As a former soldier, time is never wasted on reconnaissance, and can I ask my right hon. friend to come and get some good Dorset sea air? Yeah, yeah, yeah to visit Weymouth and to see the infrastructure for himself, because until we improve it, we can't attract the investment and the jobs and prosperity that we desperately need at an, an ancient seaside resort that needs a bit of love, attention and government money. <laughs> I, I, I can think of nothing nicer than a, a, a trip to, to Weymouth, which I think was the favourite watering, watering hole of, of George III, I'm told, by, uh, by, by the Lord Chancellor. Uh, I, I, but, uh, uh, I will do my utmost to, to oblige you. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. My constituents spent hours waiting to get through to someone on the government-issued number for non-British nationals in Afghanistan. Distressed and fearful for his family, he was relieved when he eventually spoke to someone. However, when they thought my constituent had hung up, he overheard them laughing and said to a colleague, we are having to lie to people. We are giving them false hope. The whole thing is an entire scam. Is it the Foreign Secretary, the Defence Secretary, the Home Secretary or the Prime Minister who is responsible for this scam? Uh, Mr Speaker, the, I think the whole country should be proud of what we have done uh, to welcome people from Afghanistan. Operation Warm Welcome uh, continues, and, uh, and as I speak to you, Mr Speaker, we have already received more than 15,000 people uh, from the Kabul airlift, the biggest exercise this country has undertaken. I am sorry to hear about the particular case that she raises. Uh, can, I, can, I propose that she, can I ask her uh, to send it directly uh, to me, and I will take it up? Anderson. Thank you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Now then, we have thousands, thousands of illegal immigrants arriving on our shores every single month. When are we going to take some direct action and send the boat straight back? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I, I share the, I share the indignation and the frustration of my honourable friend at, uh, at the cruel behaviour of the gangsters, the, uh, the criminal masterminds who are uh, taking money from uh, desperate, frightened people uh, to help them uh, take a very, very dangerous journey across the Channel. Uh, this is a uh, perennial problem, uh, but we were with a, well, my right-hand friend, the Home Secretary, is dealing with it in the best possible way, which is to uh, make sure that they don't leave those French shores. We depend to a large extent on what the French are doing, uh, but clearly, uh, as time goes on and this problem continues, we are going to have to make sure that we use every possible tactic at our disposal to stop what I think is a vile trade and a manipulation of people's hopes. Neil Hanvey. Thank you, Mr Speaker. According to the Joseph Roundtree Foundation, my constituency, Kirkcaldy and Cowden Beath, is the fourth most impacted by the cut to working tax credits and universal credit, uh, and it's impacting families that are working in multiple jobs. £1,000 may only cover the cost for a single roll of wallpaper in the Prime Minister's flat. However, can he please uh, set out his understanding of the plight of the working poor and can he explain to the House what he means when he says they should see their wages rise through their own efforts? Uh, Mr Speaker, I, I think that everybody, everybody sympathises with uh, people who are uh, on low incomes, who we try to uh, protect throughout the pandemic. And uh, my right honourable friend, the Chancellor, brought forward a package that was uh, recognised around the world as being almost uniquely progressive in the way that we directed funding and support at the lowest paid and at the neediest. And that was quite, uh, quite right. But what we're also now trying to do, Mr Speaker, is ensure that we have a high wage and high skilled jobs led recovery. And that is what is happening. And I'm proud, Mr Speaker, to be a Conservative Prime Minister who is seeing wages rise now for the lowest pay by the lowest paid by the fastest rate for many years. Yeah. 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 
This is, I think, the first opportunity the whole House will have to thank all of those who played a role in rolling out the superb vaccine programme over the last uh, six months or so, ranging from the whole of the National Health Service, the military, and if I may, Mr. Speaker, a particular word for the Order of St. John, St. John Ambulance, of which I have the honour to be an honorary commander. All parties in the House who might have an interest in St. John will have an opportunity to thank them personally if they'd like to do so in a reception which I'm hosting on the terrace straight after PMQs today. <laughs> and it might be that you, Mr. Speaker, or perhaps the Prime Minister or others, would, well, would honour us with their presence just to thank these thousands of volunteers who've done such superb work yeah. over the last six months. Yeah. Uh, I, I indeed join my honourable friend in thanking the. Uh, St. John's Ambulance for every, St. John Ambulance for everything that they do. They've been fantastic, and I've met many, many St. John Ambulance volunteers uh, during the last 18 months. They've done an uh, absolutely as, astonishing job. Uh, I, can, I don't think I can myself come to his uh, reception, but I hope it will be well attended. I'm sure it, I'm sure it will be very well, uh, very well attended. Uh, can I take this opportunity, Mr. Speaker, uh, to urge everybody in the country who has not yet had a vaccination, who is eligible uh, for one, to get it as soon as they can? Peter Kyle. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. With a net approval rating among Tory supporters of minus 53, can the Prime Minister get to his feet, put his hand on his heart, promise the country, this House and his own supporters that the Education Secretary is the right person for the job and he's up to the job? Uh, Mr Speaker, I think the whole House... Uh, will recognise that the Education Secretary has done a heroic job of dealing uh, with a, a, a very difficult circumstance in which we've had to, we've had to close schools, Mr Speaker, uh, during the pandemic. And, and never forget, never forget, uh, I think the job, of, the job of teachers, the job of parents up and down the land would have been made much easier if Labour, uh, and the Labour leadership in particular, had had the guts, and he'd had the guts, to say to say that schools are safe, Mr Speaker. Julia Marson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Does my right honourable friend agree with me that our constituents, including mine in Hartford and Stortford, should come forward, see their GP if they have concerns about their health, and that his statement yesterday should give them assurance, confidence, that this government is there for the NHS and that the NHS will be there for them in their time of need? Yes, Mr Speaker, and that's why we're putting another £36 billion under the measure we're putting forward uh, tonight. And I'm absolutely astonished that the party of Nybev has repeated or confirmed today uh, that they're not going to, to vote for that. We want GPs to be seeing the right people at the right time. We want to fix the waiting list, uh, Mr Speaker, and that is the objective of the, me of the measures that we're bringing forward. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Funding for organisations helping vulnerable or hard-to-reach citizens with the EU resettlement scheme is due to end at the end of this month. My own constituent tried to get assistance from local citizens' advice in March, but funding cuts meant they couldn't help him. He's been unable to get support from the Resolution Centre either and has now been refused settled status. So can I ask the Prime Minister what practical support will be provided to EU citizens still navigating this system and what does the Prime Minister advise my constituent to do to ensure that he has the right to stay in his home of 47 years? Uh, well, I'm, I'm of course uh, sorry to hear about the troubles her constituent is, is experiencing, uh, but I would just remind her that uh, under the EU uh, settlement scheme, uh, we have helped, I think, uh, almost six million uh, people uh, to, uh, to settle in this country. I think a number which is uh, far more. Uh, than uh, double the number uh, that was e uh, expected at the time of the Brexit referendum, Mr Speaker, and I think a tribute, a tribute to the compassion uh, of this country and its willingness to help those who come here and make their lives here. Tom Bell. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. St Francis Tower in Ipswich has been a beneficiary of the Building and Safety Fund. However, Oanda and Block Management, who manage the building, have put a, a, a shrink wrap on the entire tower, which is going to be on there for up to 12 months, so many of those tenants who are desperate are living in darkness for 12 months and they've put bars on the windows so they can barely open them. Does the Prime Minister agree with me that yes, this vital work needs to take place, but we need to balance, we need to do this work quickly with the lives and the mental health of those people who are desperate and are in that tower right now? Uh, I, I, my my honourable friend, I th I'm sure, raises a very uh, important point. I will, I will study the detail of what he said. I will ask the uh, Secretary of State for Communities and Local uh, Government to take up uh, the, uh, the matter directly. Gareth Thomas. Mr. Speaker, working people who are graduates, such as a newly qualified nurse, earning the average wage or under, 
will face a marginal tax rate of almost 50 per cent under the plans he is bringing in today. Isn't this yet another example of the Conservative Party asking those on lower incomes to pay more so that his privileged friends have to pay less? No, Mr Speaker. As, as, I, as I've said, uh, the, the, the top 20 per cent of income Households pay uh, 40 times more than the, the, the poorest, and uh, as for pay, as for pay for nurses, uh, Mr. Yeah. Speaker, that is exactly what this measure funds, uh, and, and it is, it is, it, and that is why it is so astonishing that he and his party are actually determined to vote against it tonight. Final question, Peter Bob. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. This Friday, I have a private member's bill, asylum seekers return to safe countries bill. The intention is, if an asylum seeker comes to this country from a safe country, they're returned to that country, and it would end the problem of people coming across the Channel. Would the Prime Minister urge his colleagues to vote for the bill on Friday? Uh, Mr Speaker, what I can uh, tell him is that we have brought forward the Sovereign Borders Bill, uh, which, of course, uh, will no longer make it uh, possible for uh, the law to treat somebody who has come here illegally in the same way as someone who has come here legally. And I think it is high time that that distinction uh, was made and people understand that there is a price to pay if they come to this country in an, Ill in an illegal fashion. Can, can I just say, there is some disappointment we didn't get through the list. Can I just say an appeal to the leaders to see if we can speed up to get those members who miss out? Point of order. No, point of order is not from now. Come after your cues. Uh, we've got. What, what is it relevant to? We've got an urgent question. But no, normally they come after your cues. That's the, you know that better than anybody. You're the expert. In fact, you're Mr. Protocol. You know better than me. We now come to the urgent question, Alistair Carmichael. Thank you.